May I please call on stage Group CEO and MD Mahindra and Mahindra and President Fikki, Dr. Anish Shah, also my colleague TV9 Networks, our Shri Dharan to host the session, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session, which we are calling the Consumption Conundrum. Uh, I don't think uh, there's anyone better to talk about it than uh, Mr. Shah, because m and is such a group which straddles pretty much the entire spectrum of goods and services, Mr. Shah. So let me start with a very fundamental question, which I'm sure a lot of people here probably want to know. We're talking about this consumer divide, which is between the urban consumer and the rural consumer. Uh, premiumization at the top end, which is among the urban consumers, whereas rural consumer is not even able to buy some of the uh, basic necessities, like let's say packaged FMCG goods. Is this symptomatic or something which is going to be chronic, or is this a seasonal uh, issue? Uh, so it, we don't actually believe there is as much of a divide as you're mentioning. I'd provide two perspectives here. First is that we are seeing more of a K-shaped recovery. So consumers at the higher end of the income segment are buying, and that's what you've seen in real estate and a number of other things in urban India. But consumers at the lower end of the income segment are not buying as much, even in urban India. In rural, we've seen very strong demand across SUVs. Tractors has been relatively flat this year, but that comes after a couple of years ago where we had a 27% growth in the industry. So we are not worried at this point about rural demand being lower. Uh, we have seen government spend in rural India be very strong post-pandemic, and that enabled rural India to essentially lead the country through the pandemic. And after that, rightly so, that spend has come down to normal levels, and therefore we are seeing some challenges in a sense of markets being flat or slightly down, but I really don't think that's a problem. That's part of the growth story that we will have. Right. You mentioned COVID. So if you look at the data, it does seem to suggest that the impact of COVID on rural economy has been uh, much more than uh, in the urban centers in terms of employment, income levels, and everything. Uh, was it accentuated or aggravated perhaps by a poor monsoon, a Kharif crop? Uh, this year it was. We've seen a number of good monsoons over the last few years. And this year it was uh, somewhat weaker, and which is why we are seeing some amount of stress in the short run. But as I said earlier, this is not something that worries us. We think rural India is still very strong and will continue to be strong. Right. Uh, and if you look at the uh, you know, investment uh, that needs to go into rural, uh, the Prime Minister just announced uh, a 700 lakh ton plan for storing drainage, which I'm told will be the largest storage facility uh, for any country. Uh, why has uh, industry been reluctant, if I, you know, if I can say that, to make greater investment in the agri-sector? Because there are many opportunities along the agri-supply chain, uh, right from processing to storage to marketing, where industry could play a much larger role. Uh, so why don't we see more investment coming from industry in things like storage or uh, you know, even marketing and processing? I think the broader question has been, why is private capex fairly low so far. Because if you look at the last few years, it's essentially been government capex that's really driving the economic growth at this point in time. And there are multiple factors. We've gone through a time when there are a huge amount of uncertainties around the world. And suddenly when you feel things are back and stable again, something else happens. So that has resulted in companies pulling back to some extent. But if you look at certain pockets, we are still seeing significant growth. And I think we are poised at a point today where private capex will start taking off. And that will apply to agriculture as well as many other sectors because we're starting to see capacity utilization hit certain levels where capex has to come in. And the India growth story is just amazingly strong right now. And that's going to essentially pull private capex in and, and have that grow much faster. Right. So one of the big highlights of the uh, budget this year was the fact that the finance minister projected only a 5.1 percent fiscal deficit, which in, 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 in some way, she was leaving room for uh, industry to actually start borrowing, and the government doesn't crowd out industry from the market. Uh, 
So what are the sectors where you think we'll start seeing some investment happening fairly quickly? Uh, because if you look at the government uh, spending, it has actually been very aggressive. It's doubled in three to four years. Uh, so I think it's high time the private sector caught up with the government. I, I would agree with that. We've in fact started. So at Mahindra, we have doubled capacity in our auto business. And we're going to put in even more capacity as we go forward. Our tractor capacity is up by 60%. And uh, we're looking at uh, tripling the capacity for our resorts in India. So this is just the start. There is a lot more investment that's coming in. Um, and we're going to see a lot more growth across multiple sectors in India. Right. But the reality remains, uh, Mr. Shah, is that a lot of our workforce is still employed in the agriculture sector. And there's a huge un uh, underemployment, I would say, in agriculture. Incomes don't justify that sort of uh, labor force. We need a long-term plan to move people out of agriculture into manufacturing and services. Um, you're not just the MD of Mahindra and Mahindra, but you're also the president of FIKI. So what can the industry do to help with this transition to move more workers out of agriculture into other industries? So I think the vision has been very well outlined in the Prime Minister's Vixit Bharat agenda. Because to reach $30 trillion as an economy, and $17,250 from a per capita standpoint, manufacturing has to go from 18% to 25% of GDP. For that to happen, manufacturing has to go up 16 times in the next 23 years. 16 times. Right? And therefore, industry will have to play a significant role. And as industry sees growth across multiple sectors, that's where investment is going to come in. And uh, therefore, I don't see that as really a challenge at this point in time because it's going to be driven by the growth. The challenge for us will be to ensure inclusive growth. That's where you started with to say, is there a divide urban versus rural? And I don't think it's urban versus rural. It's among the richer segments of society versus the not so rich segments. And that's why inclusive growth is very important for us to drive. Right. I think you couldn't uh, you know, have uh, hit the nail on the head better because just 5% of the rich households drive almost one-third of the consumption in this country, which is, I think, very unique to India in some sense. Um, there's obviously a, a need to broad-base the consumer base itself, uh, but I think that's a function of the economic growth. And as we grow, go from an economy which is 2,300 per capita income to, let's say, about 5,400, 500 uh, by, let's say, 2031, uh, there are millions of new consumers who are going to come into the consumption uh, fold. Uh, by some estimate, it'll be about 180 million. Uh, how do you think that's going to, uh, you know, change the dynamics of the market, and how is industry going to uh, leverage that? that? That's exactly what's going to change the dynamics, because it's not just going to 5,000, 5,500 by 31, but then, and this is the number I think that is the most amazing number for Vixit Bharat, which is 17,000 per capita income by 2047. Uh, that just means you're going to have a large number of people move into what we call middle class and upper middle as well, and that's going to fuel the growth from an economic standpoint. If we're talking about 7% growth right now, our sense is it's going to go to 8% next year, and possibly even higher after that, as you start seeing a much higher growth in per capita, because that's what's going to be spent. Right. The unfortunate uh, thing is that before you can consume, you actually need to earn. So we are looking at an era where there's going to be huge disruption, whether it's the auto industry, where uh, IC engines are facing increasing threat from EVs. Uh, we're looking at artificial intelligence. There was a panel discussion earlier this afternoon on artificial intelligence, where we looked at the impact. So we are going to be faced with an era of great disruptions. Uh, how is it going to uh, impact employment and industry's ability to source the right, right kind of talent uh, uh, from the pool? We talk about a, you know, a large labor pool, young workforce. Uh, is there something that industry is now worried about or is there a plan that you want to put in place which prepares you for that eventuality? With every disruption is an opportunity. And therefore, as we look at electric vehicles, for example, this is an opportunity for India to take leadership in the world. With ICE, it's been a little too late. We have great models in India now. But EV is a space where we can really build world-class cars and take that leadership. Okay. Similarly with AI, India is very well positioned with its strengths in technology. And so far, it's been used outbound in a sense that it's for companies outside India. 
but increasingly we are starting to use that for companies in India. Can they change the game and again take leadership on the world stage? Can we create more world champions? We've heard the Prime Minister say this many times. And that's where the opportunity comes in. Right. The challenge, again, if I come back to that, is skilling. And how do we ensure skilling to ensure that these transitions happen smoothly? And more importantly, I would highlight participation of women in the workforce. And how do we ensure equality? How do we ensure inclusive growth uh, from that perspective as well? These are the challenges if we can address it will place India on in a very, very strong footing. You should have joined us earlier today and uh, last evening because that was what we were talking about, uh, Nari Shakti in India. Uh, I have two more questions, uh, Mr. Shah, because we're running out of time. Uh, one is uh, on the China uh, plus one strategy. By all accounts, China is probably going to be in uh, a long-term slowdown, maybe five to ten years. That's what the best of economists and best of brokerage houses are telling us. Um, do you see a greater shift of manufacturing happening from China to India? Uh, and what sectors would these be? So first, I strongly object to China plus one. Why is <laughs> India plus one? Right? India stands much stronger than China does today. <laughs> India has got rule of law. There is no concern about IP protection in India. India has got a large base of consumers the ability to make in India and export is very high. So India really will stand on its own right in discussions with various global leaders. They are looking at India very seriously right now. Ease of business has been a challenge in the past. It's largely been addressed. There's still some more to be done on that front. The recent budget providing incentive for states is a great step in that direction because often the center and the states have not been fully coordinated in terms of driving that ease, and hopefully that is moving on forward now. Mm -hmm. uh, the second aspect is around infrastructure and logistics. And there again, we are seeing huge amounts of infrastructure being put in from roads to ports to airports, uh, logistics hubs, and as all of that comes in, it's only going to make it easier for big manufacturing hubs to come into India. So this story, I think, is coming together fairly well. Right, and finally, what about uh, semiconductor? There's a lot of push which the government itself is giving. There's a lot of interest, at least on paper. Uh, are we going to become a, a semiconductor uh, you know, country, let's say, in a span of five to 10 years? What's your own view on that? So we will have to do more with semiconductors because Atman Nirbhartha and that is very important. We have to be able to make in India. It's not going to be five to 10 years. The semiconductor journey is much longer than that. And that's a journey that we have to undertake. It is being done very seriously at this point in time. Uh, and again, we do have strengths from a design perspective, et cetera, that we can leverage to make it shorter. But my sense is it's going to be at least a 10 to 20 year journey, uh, maybe even a bit longer. Right. My absolutely final question, Mr. Shah. We are talking about India making the next big leap. Uh, the government has a target of 30 trillion by 2047. Uh, how confident are you of India being able to do that? Oh, very confident. And this is something that we are doing with driving exponential growth across our businesses and investments we are putting in. Uh, so we are putting money where our mouth is on this front. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Shah. It, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Mr. Anish Shah for his frank views.